Do you want to talk about the history of HRT? I mean, you know, it was a largely normal practice uh, in the 1960s. They, you know, certainly had some fits and starts, right? They initially were just replacing estrogen, um, figured out pretty quickly, i.e. within a few years, that if you only gave a woman estrogen, you were going to run the risk of endometrial cancer going up because the endometrial lining just continued to get bigger and bigger and bigger and you eventually developed hyperplasia, which presumably became metaplasia and ultimately cancer. We figured out pretty quickly how to combat that. If you just oppose the estrogen with progesterone, you keep the endometrial lining in check. And this largely became the, um, uh, the standard of care through the 1980s uh, and into the 1990s. And this was largely validated by epidemiologic uh, observations, which showed that women who took hormones did significantly better. Now, people who listen to this podcast are well aware of how critical I am of epidemiology, and it's certainly very easy to make the case that in the 1980s, women who were taking hormones had a healthy user bias, right? These are women that probably had better access to healthcare. They were probably more health conscious. And as a result, they were probably doing many more things to improve the quality of their health. So the NIH did something that I think made a lot of sense. It was the right thing to do, which was they said, look, we can't rely on this epidemiology. We need to do a randomized control trial. And they did it through something called the Women's Health Initiative which had two, two components, a nutritional component uh, that was asking a question about low fat diets and then um, a component that was looking at the HRT. So um, would you like to pick up the story as to how the study was designed, maybe talk about some of the, the, the potential pitfalls of it and, and ultimately how the results of that have been misunderstood and misinterpreted for so long? The fact that this story hasn't been made into a Hollywood uh, biopic mega drama, I don't know, right? This is a big deal. A billion dollars of our resources went into doing this study. And there are many things that we learned that were helpful and useful and this huge set of data that we're still using today to extrapolate information from. And there was a lot of good that came from it. But there was a lot of misinformation and just really bad marketing marketing or really effective marketing, you could argue, because what is so wild, Peter, is that when this study came out um, and they did a press conference, okay, before the study was published, they did a press conference. Have you ever seen the NIH do a press conference <laughs> that Matt Lauer talked about or that was made it on, you You know, like Good Morning America? Like they did a press conference. It, I remember I was in medical school at the time. Like I remember sort of, you know, this happening and they said, Okay, this we had to stop the study early. It is increasing the risk of breast cancer and increasing the risk of blood clots and cardiovascular disease, and we have to stop the study. And everybody, this there's different statistics out there, but people will say about 40% maybe of women were on hormone therapy at the time. Overnight, it went, it crashed to nothing. You're talking billions of dollars of an industry went to nothing. And the the people who are prescribing the hormone therapy were like, this doesn't make any sense. I, I do this. I've been doing this for 20 years, 30 years. I don't have a clinic full of people who are dying of blood clots or heart attacks or who get breast cancer. Like, this is not my clinic. Whose clinic is this? And then over the years, you know, then they published the paper. And, and as we talked about, you know, before we did this podcast is that they misinterpreted the data so drastically and scared everybody so with so much fear that you actually have an entire generation that has forgotten how to prescribe hormone therapy. And this is where the nightmare that we're living in today, because now we realize that the data was misinterpreted. So if we talk about, and again, and the WHI was one medication, one dose. That's it. And it was a sort of birth control pill style kind of hormone therapy. So a synthetic estrogen and uh, uh, progestin. It was not sort of the what we call, you know, more um, and we can talk about the marketing term bioidentical, but the FDA approved products that we use today, like estradiol and progesterone, they're different medications that we use today. And so you're talking one medication, one dose, and we are still practicing fear-based medicine 30 years later, whatever it is, saying like, 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 we don't practice any other medicine like this. We're like, well, there was one study about surgery 30 years ago, and that's the way we practice medicine, right? We evolve, we learn new things. So what did it show? Let's talk about the good. 
when you took estrogen and progestin or estrogen alone, you had a decreased risk of colon cancer. You had decreased risk of fractures, like significant decrease of fractures. Decrease of diabetes. Okay, that seems like a good, those seem like all good things. This is in the hormones we don't even really prescribe anymore, right? We saw a decrease in overall mortality, a decrease in cancer-specific mortality. Um, and then when you looked at the cardiovascular data over time, and again, I'm a urologist, I'm not a heart expert, but you saw there was actually no difference, right? It actually wasn't so scary. Now, as you get older, we know birth control pills can cause blood clots. So we do worry about giving a birth control pill to grandma because you can increase blood clots, right? That's true. I agree with that. When it comes to breast cancer, the most fascinating data that didn't make the press conference, women who are on the estrogen alone, so they didn't have a uterus, so they didn't need the progestin therapy, had a decreased risk of getting and dying from breast cancer, right? And that didn't make the news. Estrogen was never this, even in that study that put the box labeling on all the products, it's not true, right? So then when you looked at the estrogen and the progestin groups, there was a fear that there was an increased risk of incidence, but not mortality from breast cancer. And even when you look at that data, there is questioning of the fact that the placebo group actually was more protected by breast cancer because many of them had been on hormones in the past. And when you use a correct placebo group, the, the lines actually go together. And so you're more of a statistics nerd than I am, but the reality is there was no difference. And so we scared an entire generation of people away from hormones because of a bad misinterpretation of statistics. So Rachel, I don't know how good you are at sensing a person's blood pressure from across the room, but if you were able to sort of project your 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 vision into my carotid artery. I see it bulging. Yeah, you you'd <laughs> notice that my my blood pressure is up. It, I'm probably at 180 over 120 right now. Um, first off, I think that was a remarkable succinct summation of the WHI. I'm only going to repeat a few things, be, not because I didn't think you did a great job, you did, but because sometimes hearing it twice highlights the egregiousness of this study. Shout it from every rooftop you can find. Um, and truthfully, I have friends, female friends, and I have patients who to this day are paranoid about hormones. And I just, I, I want to offer yet another uh, opportunity for them to, to sort of understand what's going on. So this was a study that had, you know, two parallel arms, right? One where women without a uterus were just randomized to either the synthetic uh, or equine-based estrogen versus a placebo. And then one where if you had a uterus, you got MPA, a synthetic progesterone and the estrogen. As you pointed out, the um, elephant in the room here was the one finding that got all of the attention was that in the women with the uterus group, if you got the synthetic progestin and estrogen, you had an increase in your incidence of breast cancer. It turned out it didn't actually lead to any change in mortality from breast cancer, but there was an increase in the incidence. Now, um, the number is really scary if it's given in relative terms. It was a 24% increase in the incidence, incidence for the listener meaning getting breast cancer, right? So you had a 24% higher chance of getting breast cancer if you took the uh, two hormones. On the surface, that sounds devastating, but again, as people who listen to this podcast know, we always need to think in terms of absolute risk. And relative risk doesn't mean that much if you don't understand absolute risk. So if I said to you, Rachel, um, I have a treatment for you that is going to fix a hundred problems, but it increases your risk by 100% of getting hit by an asteroid. Would you take the medicine or not? Well, you'd have to know what your base level risk of getting hit by an asteroid is. And given that it's almost zero, doubling it doesn't mean anything, right? So the absolute risk increase for these women was 0.1%. So to put that in less technical terms, it meant that you will, even if you believe the results of that study, and you've offered a great explanation for why the actual results should be questioned, but even if you take them at face value, for every 1,000 women who were put on HRT, an additional one got breast cancer, though she didn't die from it 
at any increased rate to the women who didn't get the hormone. This to me is, and I'd like you to push back on this, although I'm worried you won't be able to because you share my bias. This is the greatest injustice imposed by the modern medical system in our lifetime. You are not going to get pushback from me on that. I think women's, I think that, this is a disaster. I just got back yesterday from teaching at the largest internal medicine conference, ACP, the American College of Physicians, and you're talking more than 20,000 internal medicine physicians. I was asked, what a wonderful thing, I was asked to give a course on female sexual dysfunction, and it was wonderful. I talked a lot about menopause. There was no other menopause content at this course. There was no courses, how to prescribe, given everything you've done, my colleagues and myself have done to bring it into sort of just popularity. Patients are coming in asking questions and there wasn't even a course to learn. I can't say that's true for GLP-1s or any of these lipid lowering agents or all of the things that you've been pushing. The problem is you now have a you have a brain drain, I think, because the doctors who prescribed hormone therapy either retired or died, right? And there was no one they taught ahead of them. Now, I was very lucky. I had very good mentorship and incredible experience, but we are now trying to make up for lost time to train people how to write prescriptions. So it's not enough to say, hey, the WHI was misinterpreted and we've done a bad thing for when people don't know how to do this. And it's not a small, like it's, it's a huge problem. And the reality is this is half the population. This is not niche medicine. The fact right. that menopause medicine is the time tiniest little uh, room of, of, of subset of gynecology, which it should not be under gynecology, right? This is whole body medicine, and yet nobody seems to care. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear you say that because you're, you're highlighting something that's as dramatic and potentially more dramatic than the thing I've tended to focus on. I've, I've focused more so maybe I just take for granted that I got lucky and I had amazing mentors and they taught me how to do this stuff. But it's also the nature of my personality to just be endlessly curious and show up in somebody's clinic for two weeks and, and do this. I've tended to focus on the lost generation of women, right? So I had my analysts do this analysis two years ago and I don't remember the exact numbers, but the analysis was calculate for me or estimate for me the number of women who were deprived of HRT because of the WHI and calculate the excess mortality that was achieved through that injustice, through hip fractures, cardiovascular disease. Like we just went through the entire list, right? Like, so calculate the number of lives that were lost, the amount of disability that was incurred, because to your point, even if you don't die from a hip fracture, 50% of survivors never regain the same level of function. Um, and I didn't even know how to quantify all of the sexual side effects that women unnecessarily endured, all of the vasomotor side effects that they unnecessarily endured. Didn't even try to quantify that because I don't know how to. But, you know, that's the thing that I focus on. And again, it's personal to someone my age because my mother and my mother-in-law are in that category, right? Like they're the ones that got absolutely screwed by this system. Um, you're highlighting something equally and potentially, equally catastrophic with potentially a greater impact, which is we failed to train a generation of doctors to do anything about it. And if that's not reversed, the problem doesn't get much better. Yeah, I mean, the data is very clear on this, right? Less than 6% of internal medicine, OBGYN, or family practice doctors get even an hour of menopause education in their training. Do you remember learning about menopause in your medical school? Zero. Zero, Not one right? Minute. I didn't learn one minute of it. And so here's I the- I did learn that hormones were bad. Oh, yeah, you yeah, learned, yeah, right, right. So, so there's this, this so, so because you are taught hormones are dangerous or the bodybuilders take the hormones, the snake oil salesmen take the hormones, right? Like we don't talk about this in real medicine, right? So you actually have, everyone says it's not my, 
It's not yeah. my industry. It's not my thing. I went to this internal medicine conference, you know, yesterday, and all the internal medicine doctors were saying, "But this isn't this isn't my field. Like, I don't feel comfortable." Right? An endocrinologist was standing there saying, "I don't feel comfortable doing this." I said, "You're a hormone doctor. Like, that is what you do." It is so embarrassing. I've been asked to speak at multiple academic centers to teach on hormone therapy, and every time I'm like, "Is this real life?" I am a urologist teaching hormone doctors about how to prescribe hormone therapy. And it is real life. And this is why I'm so loud about it, because it, we have to change this. We have to change this on a big level because I need the ICU doctors and the pulmonologists and the card in the, you know, the heart doctors and all the doctors to know that menopause affects their organs, right? Colon cancer. Why aren't why aren't GI doctors talking to women that estrogen prevents colon cancer? Why are we checking DEXAs at 65? Like, why are rheumatologists not prescribing hormone therapy? I found out recently that psychiatrists, because I do a lot of teaching about how to prescribe hormone therapy. A few of us are very passionate about it. And I was like, sit with me. I will teach you how to write the prescriptions. I've had psychiatrists tell me their malpractice insurance will not cover them if they prescribe hormone therapy. And I said, wait a minute. You prescribe postpartum depression drugs, which are progestin-based right? You do reproductive psychiatry, which means birth control is a part of what you do. And you're being told you're not allowed to prescribe hormone therapy when hormone therapy is one of the greatest antidepressants in the history of, of medicine. It is insanity. We're living in a nightmare. I'm Peter Atia. This podcast relies exclusively on premium subscribers for support, which allows us to provide all our content without taking a single penny from advertisers. I believe this keeps my content honest, making it a trusted resource for listeners like you. As a premium member, you'll get immediate access to our entire back catalog of AMA episodes and all future AMA episodes. You'll get longevity-focused premium articles packed with actionable insights, You'll get unrivaled show notes for each and every episode of The Drive, every topic, every study, every resource from each episode carefully curated for you. You'll get quarterly podcast summaries where you'll learn my biggest personal takeaways from the previous 90 days of expert guest episodes and much more. This journey doesn't have to be navigated alone. We can take these steps towards a better, longer life together. Become a premium member today at peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe to join me in a shared commitment to a healthier future.